What's the role of UN peacekeepers? The Democratic Republic of Congo has asked the UN to withdraw its troops, saying it's failed to protect civilians. But what's the alternative? And will this pave the way for private armies to take over? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The United Nations peacekeeping mission has been around for more than 60 years. In that time, it's helped many countries transition from conflict to peace and stability. Its troops are deployed by member states and number in the tens of thousands. But there's a growing pushback against the Blue Helmets, especially in Africa, where some host nations say they've lost confidence in their mission. Democratic Republic of Congo is among those calling for their withdrawal or who have already sent them packing. Critics say peacekeeping needs reform, while others say it does important work despite its shortcomings. We'll get the thoughts of our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Fenton Monahan. UN peacekeepers have been deployed to Democratic Republic of Congo for around a quarter of a century. A large part of their mandate is to protect civilians from armed groups. But now the Congolese president says they've failed in their mission and wants them gone. Il est à déplorer. It is to be deplored that the peacekeeping missions deployed for 25 years in the Democratic Republic of Congo have failed to cope with the rebellions and armed conflicts which are tearing apart the region, nor to protect the civilian population. Many civilians in DRC feel the same way. Earlier this month, protesters demanded the peacekeepers go. They accused the UN of doing little to protect them. The Congolese army cleared the demonstrations. 43 people were killed. UN peacekeepers have also worn out their welcome elsewhere. They left Sudan's Darfur region in 2021 at the urging of the government. And Mali has become one of the latest countries to demand that they pull out. The UN has admitted to shortcomings, but says that without peacekeepers, things will be much worse. Growing divisions among member states, combined with the increased complexity of today's conflicts, poses a formidable challenge to peacekeeping and a broader task of maintaining peace and security. I encourage you to consider the alternative and to, Im to imagine how these situations would evolve if peacekeepers were not present to undertake these daily efforts. In many places, mercenaries are filling the void, including those from Russia's Wagner Group. And as criticism of UN peacekeeping grows, critics say reforms are needed in order to overcome this crisis of confidence. Vincent Monaghan for Inside Story. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. In New York, Musa Kondo, executive director at the Sahel Institute and a former special advisor to the president of Mali. In London, Tara O'Connor, founder and executive director at Africa Risk Consulting. And in Geneva, Mukesh Kapila, a former UN resident and humanitarian coordinator for Sudan. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Uh, Mukesh, let me start with you today. So, DRC is set to begin discussions with U.N. authorities for an accelerated withdrawal of U.N. peacekeepers from December 2024 to December 2023. I, I want to get your impressions as far as if you think that is a realistic timeline. Uh, why not? It's, uh, there's a year, so I think they can do it. And I don't think it's going to make much difference to the situation on the ground if they were to leave some months uh, early. Uh, Mukesh, let me also ask you, uh, you know, UN peacekeeping missions in Africa are coming under a lot of criticism. You, of course, have experience as a UN peacekeeper in Sudan. Um, are UN peacekeeping missions actually working anymore? They used to work when they were part of much more comprehensive uh, operations, uh, which made the peace, which kept the key, peace, and which built the peace. But in recent uh, decades, they have become fragmented. They have not been as well resourced as they need to. And of course, we live in a much more quarrelsome uh, world where the troops providing the peacekeepers and the nations funding them are at uh, loggerheads. So they are more and more ineffective, and I think they should be put out of their misery. Musa, um, UN peacekeepers have also worn out their welcome in other places. Uh, they've left Sudan's Darfur region in 2020 at the urging of the government. Uh, Mali is now the latest country to demand they pull out. Um, I want to ask you, what do you think will happen in Mali once peacekeepers pull out? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, since 
the decision to withdraw the uh, the mission from Mali, uh, we're still having a lot of things going on. So as you mentioned, we have different realities according to the countries and according to context also. Uh, the case of Mali, the UN mission was occupying the, the, the areas where the different uh, stakeholders, the former rebel groups, uh, now the signatory of the peace agreement and the government of Mali. So now occupying these barracks after the MINUSMA is creating uh, a little bit problems in the field, then reality what MINUSMA was bringing to the peace and the stability in the country. Uh, Musa, uh, let me also ask you, from your vantage point, what exactly is the alternative here? Uh, if peacekeepers continue to pull out, is that going to pave the way potentially for private armies just to take over more and more? I mean, who, who fills the void in this instance? So now, before even the, the mission uh, start uh, withdrawing uh, from Mali, the government, the Malian transition and the authorities start recruiting a lot of Malian uh, military personnel, as you have seen in the past couple of months. But the, the problem itself is the question of the presence of the, the UN keeping missions in Mali. Because w w when you've seen since the beginning with the mandate of uh, 20, 100, uh, it start changing, and uh, the objective also start changing. And uh, finally, they just realize it, it is not necessary to have 15,000 people in the ground and not even starting what people expect from this mission. So filling the gap by themselves, by the transition and Malian army is a one point also the different partners as they said, uh, even some say Wagner groups and Malian say uh, the Russian instructors is kind of filling this gap, these empty spaces letting by the missions. Tara, I, I want to speak more specifically about the issue of UN peacekeepers and the DRC. The presence of the UN mm -hmm. in DRC has become increasingly unpopular in recent years. Critics mm -hmm. say that's due to a failure of uh, UN peacekeepers to protect civilians from violence. Now, earlier this month, protesters demanded the peacekeepers go. Uh, they've accused the UN of doing little to protect them. The Congolese army cleared demonstrations. Dozens of people were killed. What is the current level of mm -hmm. anger about the presence of UN peacekeepers in DRC, and how exactly did we get to this point? Well, I think I think the levels of anger are pretty high, um, and you know, which has actually led to this call for a rapid withdrawal. But I think we have to look at uh, where we got to and and how this came about. And I mean, if we look at the origins of the mission to Congo, it was at a very particular time. Um, when the country was actually imploding and there was a significant risk that it would split apart. But definitely over the years that the UN has been there, um, its, um, its ability to actually deal and to improve the security for civilians has been severely impaired. Um, it's also, you know, the terrain is impossible the region is largely, um, pretty much from a military point of view, largely ungovernable uh, because of its vast size, because of the uh, paucity of infrastructure, and also because of the, I think there is also a lack of willingness amongst the, uh, a lack of commitment um, to uh, really deal with the massive problems that the Eastern, Eastern Congo faces. Um, I mean, you know, without actually ever having, you know, with, you know, when you haven't been there as I as I have, it is extraordinary to think about the vast size of the area that the uh, the UN force is meant to govern. It's impossible. Yeah, Tara, I, I want to follow up with you and ask you about the fact that the UN has admitted to mm -hmm. shortcomings, but they've also said that without mm -hmm. peacekeepers in these areas, things would be much worse. From your vantage point, what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. I think that's possibly true, but they are going to be replaced, um, as far as I understand it, by a regional force of military from the regions. And I, I don't think they will necessarily fare any better. And the real risk is that you will get much more profiteering, as we saw before the UN force came in, because you're talking also about an area 
that has enormous mineral wealth that many, many countries, many regional players and many countries have a great deal of interest in. That's gold, uh, cobalt, um, further south in DRC, copper. Um, and so, you know, one has to guard against that. But I do think this is also comes into a context, a political context, a geopolitical context that we have to take into account too. And that is where African leadership is seeking African solutions for African problems. And so, uh, you know, the UN um, departure from Mali, from Congo, and replacement with local forces or regional forces um, seems to me to be the next step. Musa, there are uh, analysts and experts who have blamed the lack of success of peacekeeping forces in Africa on the operational mandates of the missions in Africa. And they've said that those mandates restrict the forces activities. Uh, what do you say to that? So this is actually a really great question and also about the understanding and the narrative around the UN missions as well. As uh, uh, my colleague just mentioned about what happening in the, in the Congo uh, from your, your question, the same thing happened in Mali uh, back in the days where uh, mission personnel were involved in a lot of scandals, uh, including sexual uh, scandals and also the context realities fact. So that made people and population wondering a lot of questions why these guys are here, even they are not uh, bringing a new uh, added value to the conflict and also to seize fire. And we've seen in the case of Mali, the, the, the mandate were really not understood at all. And even the definition of why these 15,000 people, more than that, because 15,200 something were in Mali and even not able to bring whatever we expect from them in terms of uh, opposition, the stabilization of cities, uh, the training of the, 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 the national forces. But the, the past couple of miles before uh, the mission was seized in Mali, the UN mission was uh, investing much more money and resources on development areas than peacekeeping. So we already know the UN has already agencies focusing on these areas, as also the government of Mali and, and, and local collectivities uh, are working to do the same. So now, is the money going to this through these areas or they are really going through uh, the peacekeeping mission? So these have been really very complex and very, and also the narrative around what's going on in other sides uh, about the mission for like, when you take certain part of the world where the mission stayed like a decade mm. and what did they bring in reality in, 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 in the conversation and the realities in these countries. Mukesh, uh, Musa actually uh, in his answer brought up one of the points that I wanted to ask you about, uh, and that's about the fact that peacekeeping forces have also been accused in the past of committing human rights abuses, including pervasive allegations of sexual abuse and exploitation. Uh, there have been UN investigations into these allegations, but they, they rarely lead to prosecutions. How much have scandals like that uh, tainted these peacekeeping missions? I think scandals like that and the impuni uh, impunity that comes after that has uh, certainly brought a very bad name to such operations. You know, it's not really the UN uh, command's fault because the soldiers uh, come from many different countries and they revert to those countries and the processes uh, of uh, accountability and justice have to take place in those countries. Well, very often the, the countries are ashamed what happens. They are kind of embarrassed. They protect their own kind. And the poor UN gets the blame uh, for that. So I blame not the UN, but I blame the, the, the countries from which the peacekeepers come. How come they contributed forces, ill-disciplined, and, uh, you know, now people play in, uh, uh, blame uh, forces like Wagner, which deserve to be blamed. But, you know, when uh, when uh, the soldiers of uh, well-known countries commit these kinds of abuses, it's difficult to know whether uh, who's worse than that. So uh, okay. I think the question of accountability goes to those countries uh, as to why they allow these uh, soldiers, ill-paid, ill-disciplined, ill-managed soldiers to take part in these sensitive operations. Mukesh, if I could just follow up with you, uh, but there is still a criticism by many that say that whether or not it's local forces who may be committing those crimes, 
they do say and they blame the UN for not really doing enough to make sure that people are the people are actually being put on trial. Uh, they, they say that there's very little accountability. What do you say to that? Certainly, from my time in the in the UN system in a number of different uh, positions, the UN has tried. The UN has made representations to the countries uh, uh, whose citizens commit these crimes. You know, the UN doesn't have a court sitting in, in New York to be able to do these kinds of things. It is true that sometimes the UN leadership, or often the UN leadership from Secretary General downwards, is too timorous in terms of uh, saying to countries uh, which are misbehaving as to th that they should not uh, uh, do that. And then uh, there are sanctions that can be deployed against those countries, like, for example, no more uh, peacekeepers from those countries. And that has actually happened. For example, Gabonese troops are no longer uh, deployed, or certain units uh, from certain countries will no longer be deployed. And that's a very, very good, good thing. But this issue of accountability is not just unique to peacekeeping. It is part of a general climate of impunity that affects many, many other areas in, in relation to, uh, to peace and security and associated uh, issues. You know, we had the scandals in DRC, for example, around the Ebola pandemic where uh, where uh, where uh, aid workers health workers were uh, were were, uh, were uh, asking for sex in return for jobs in organizations so so in that sense we need to take a bigger view and then look at where the accountabilities lie it's easy to blame the un as the central command but quite honestly they don't have the means and tools at their disposal to be able uh to uh, clean it up Tara, uh, it looked like you were reacting to uh, quite a bit of what Mukesh was saying there. I wanted to give you an mm. opportunity to yes. jump in. Yes, I mean, I think there is a question of, a, of accountability it goes back to the original financing. It goes back to financing of these operations where, to some extent, you've got the Global North, as it's become known, uh, really funding global, because most of the financing comes from very wealthy G7 and G. G7 countries to finance, you know, poor countries, uh, poorer countries' troops to be actually leading these peacekeeping operations. Whereas, um, you know, what you really want for peacekeeping operations is professionally trained peacekeeping operations that just do that. So I think the the financing, the staffing, the training and the operations all probably need to face reform. And I mean, this being UN peacekeeping forces being asked to leave is a crisis in confidence in the UN. Um, but you have got this northern, you know, financing from the global north, troops from the from emerging market countries mm. in third countries where they um, perhaps don't have the tools or the training um, or the equipment. And certainly in Eastern Congo, you know, it's a very the, the infrastructure is just not there. Mm. The the ability to protect people requires on requires much more aerial uh, uh, cap capacity, and that's obviously enormously expensive and and very difficult to run. Mm. So I think a lot of reform is required without throwing out the without throwing out the UN peace. Uh, keeping missions. I think they, they just need upgrading, perhaps. Mm. Uh, Musa, I, I want to shift focus here a little bit to, to something that was brought up a little bit earlier in the show. Um, you know, in many places where UN peacekeepers have either left or are considering leaving, um, mercenaries are filling the void. Uh, we're talking about everybody from Russia's Wagner Group uh, to other groups as well. Uh, Wagner has worked for governments and militaries in Central African Republic, Libya, Mali, Sudan, um, fighting rebel groups there. Um, what is the outlook if this continues? Before then, I want to like uh, about what uh, my colleagues say about the, the accountability and the responsibility of uh, these soldiers and how to take them out from the municipal heart. I, I completely disagree with this because these muni the UN missions are not a very normal missions. They are supposed to be high-valued missions to our countries. First, when they arrive, we see them as invasion uh, forces. Because imagine you have already a very 
loyal government standing. The government is not falling. The government stands and the government asks for help. And 15,000 people come to help the government and also create a system which prevent them to attack what we call the terrorists because there was no rebels after the signature of the uh, peace agreement. So that means the government and the, 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 the former rebel groups, rebels groups, are, have, are no more in, in, in fight. So the ones who are fighting the government are considered as terrorist groups mm. and even identified. So the question is why the missions stayed in the cities as, as the same as, civil, as civilians in the same area where the terrorists are attacking and pushing and pressuring the population. And they cannot attack back. And even they have been attacked in their own barracks. So this is a point we should learn from it moving forward if we want this mission to go forward. And about the integrity and the honesty in these uh, missions also, it's not just about the countries providing, mm. but they are coming to our countries as a UN mission, which is a global organization to maintain and also protect civilians all around the world, as we see mm. the missions in Europe, in other parts of the world. So they have 100% the responsibility on the mm. behaviors of soldiers when they accept to send them in the field. It's not about sending, uh, signing, I mean, uh, ethical uh, document. It's also about following mm. up. And when uh, scandals happen, you should have a procedures and protocol to make justice to make justice as every single situation. Mm. So otherwise, if itself cannot do such kind of process or procedures against the bad uh, personnel in the field, so how can you imagine a civilian from these mm. villages in central Mali or in northern Mali to, to make justice for themselves? They cannot because these guys are powerful. The procedure are so long and it's happening in New York City. So these are all the things you end up to be very careful when they're sending or selecting people to send in the field mm. and the mandate they're sending to keep or to engage when it's about the enemies or terrorist groups in the field. Musa, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let me stop you there. I'll get back to you with my original question in a minute. But I do see Mukesh uh, reacting to what you're saying. So I'm going to give you a chance to jump in. I think what's just been said is great in an ideal uh, world. But uh, we have to understand that the peacekeepers have diplomatic immunity. You can't just haul them off the crime scene where they've committed their sexual abuse or whatever and uh, bring them to New York and uh, put them up. One, there is no court there. There is no prison. There is no process. So, uh, you know, uh, we must not uh, let the countries get away with this. The fact is that many developing countries use the contributions uh, of peacekeepers as a way of earning revenue and because they get money for every soldier they send out. And so we are subsidizing their forces back home. Other peacekeepers are sent because the authoritarian states from which they come sometimes, very often, uh, it, they, they find it's much mm. uh, safer. Have these uh, soldiers uh, uh, somewhere else rather than mm. uh, uh, back in home countries uh, creating uh, coups and, and mayhem. So uh, I, I do not think that uh, this is entirely a matter of uh, the UN behaving in an mm. irresponsible manner. It's a, it's a combination uh, of the two. Maybe we need, uh, we need international courts and we need other judicial processes. We don't mm. exist in the moment in terms of discipl disciplining uh, these people. And that's why I think, uh, quite honestly, uh, when th now we're moving into regional peacekeeping more and more because uh, nobody wants to be embroiled in these conflicts in, Mukesh, in remote jungle. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, sorry and, to, I'm sorry to interrupt you as well, but, but we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, I do want to get back to Musa. Uh, Tara, I see that you want to jump in as well. I'll get to you in just a minute. Uh, Musa, I do still want to ask you, uh, when I asked you just a few moments ago, which is, what will the implications be if we start seeing more of these mercenary groups, these private armies, going into these countries? Uh, so, first of all, people are looking for solutions. And it could be private armies or it could be various different uh, diverse groups or countries like legally constituted to support or help or even hire uh, mercenaries, as you said, and you mentioned it from different places. But now, when the missions, the UN international mission failed, people and countries have to look for alternative because we cannot just sit and look at people dying. But the problems with these private armies also, they don't report to anybody. So whatever mm. happens in the field, 
human abuse situations mm. to whom we can report or, or, or civilians uh, could report to. No one. So this is a, a very dangerous situation. And the day also these private armies or mercenary groups will return against the person who's been employing them. This is not mm. forbidden because this is about business. This is not about human rights. This isn't about uh, humanity. This is not about... Uh, this is 100% money-related operations. So the day you will not be able to pay them or the day you will not be in the same page, maybe they can return just to the next situation. So that's mm. why we've seen a lot of implication of, of Russia in this in this uh, these things because the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, he himself said there is a, a Wagner groups operating in this field in the, uh, the request from this government. Mm. Um, so maybe the government, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Musa, I'm sorry to cut you off again, but we just have a couple of minutes left. I know Tara wants to jump in. And Tara, I also want to ask you about a point that Musa was raising there, which is that, you know, there has been a lot of debate as to what laws cover private armies and if private armies or mercenary groups can actually be held to account when and if their fighters commit crimes. I mean, this is a real growing concern, right? You know, they govern, they largely govern themselves. And as we have seen in, uh, in, and we only have to look at, at recent, not too distant history. You look at Sierra Leone, if you look at the private military companies that uh, got involved there, in my view, they actually accelerated, they increased the conflict because their main interest was to actually get paid, as um, as was said earlier, to get paid either in diamonds, and we had the whole blood diamonds uh, debacle. So it's definitely, and now we also see that um, that the uh, Wagner mercenaries were actually seeking how they were going to be paid, putting pressure on uh, pressure on the various military hunters that have now emerged in Mali and in Burkina Faso mm. to actually be paid directly either in concessions or actually in gold. So it's, um, you, you know, the commercial element, the lack of accountability, and also uh, the ineffectiveness. Um, we saw that um, the Wagner Group failed completely mm. in Cabo Delgado and mm. uh, Cabo in northern Mozambique and... Uh, what was required was a regional single country intervention by Rwanda, a military single country intervention mm -hmm. to restore order to Cabo Delgado. Tara, so I'm, the I'm, effectiveness... Yes. Tara, I, I do apologize. Uh, we, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Musa Kondo, Tara O'Connor, and Mukesh Kapila. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.